think we're probably good to start. Mm -hmm. And I'll just um, thank everybody for coming to the talk. We had no sense at all of coming to the whole here. here. Um, but it's nice to see so many. And um, we've got Dr. Virginia Button, who's going to be in conversation with Hamish Bolton. And um, I'll, I'll let her introduce him, but we're just really pleased to have you both here. I'll say that now. And we're going to invite you all to stay for a glass of wine after the, the talk session. Mm -hmm. So that will be out in the garden afterwards. And um, I think I'll just turn it over to Yeah, you. thank you for the invitation to make this exhibition and come here to the speak. We're, we're very, very pleased to have the work here, and to have you here to talk about it. Thank you. Thanks, Maria. Um, so, then we'll settle. So we're, we're going to talk for maybe half an hour, I'd say Max, and then open up to the audience to ask questions, because I'm sure you'll have lots of questions um, you'll be wanting to ask Hamish as well. And I'm aiming just to try and um, prompt Hamish to talk rather than necessarily be in a conversation, so I'm hoping that that will work out. Um, I'm just going to start really by saying a few words about the exhibition here, because um, in case you're not aware, it comprises an installation based on a commissioned walk, walking between walks, um, which connects the invisible footprints, footsteps of seven previous walks. Um, and Hamish, during a 12 day period this year, walked, sorry, linked the seven previously completed walks made entirely or partially in southwest England over a period of many years, which we can conveyed by the dates on here. These include the public group walks made in Penzance during the second Cornwall workshop and then marking his 40th anniversary of his commitment as an artist to the act of walking and the current commission represented here at Kessel Barton marks his 45th anniversary so this is quite an auspicious occasion. So I'm just going to start by quoting you um, a rather good I think statement about your practice and then I'm going to ask you a bit more about that. So. I'm actually going to quote Hamish now. So, um, Do I get to quote you? Yes, you can quote me back. You can read it yourself if you want. <laughs> um, so, walking is the bringing together of two entirely separate activities, walking and art. Every piece of art I materialise contains a, t a walk text. I make art exclusively from walks that I have personally experienced. If I do not make a walk, I cannot make any art. And so, um, Hamish, you've described yourself as a walking artist, which I think is genuinely a, a distinctive um, way of working as an artist. And I'd like to start by asking you, um, when did your concern for nature start and what led you to develop walking as an art practice? Mm. So it goes back a little bit there. Yeah, I think um, uh, being um, an old an old artist. Uh, when I was a child, I grew up in Newcastle, and um, it was very normal just walking everywhere. So um, there was no there was no kind of issue of a big effort of um, being converted to walking because it was normal. But then the issue is, can you change that sort of vague childhood background into a position for art making? Um, so then, in a way, for, with regard to walking, then leaping ahead to uh, mid-1960s um, at St. Martin's School of Art in London, and then there was uh, the senior lecturer, uh, Peter Atkins, um, he gave me the sentence, uh, why not make art about something that you're interested in? And, and it's a very short sentence, but it's also, um, when you're young, uh, very kind of revolutionary, the full impact, the extrapolation of the meaning of to do that because ordinarily you, as a student, understandably, you see this artist's paintings and even though you just deny it black and blue, you, you're making paintings like that one yourself and that's your way of learning uh, by going through that kind of a process. So, um, so when, when the idea came up well, in discussion with Peter Atkins, the idea to uh, make, he didn't, he didn't say walking, but he did say to make art about something that you're interested in. Um, so that really takes you to you know another uh, part of the possibilities of creativity, ra rather than kind of immediately connecting on to the history of let's say you know British landscape painting for example. 
Yes, because that um, has your work was misinterpreted for some time, Thank wasn't you. it? Um, <laughs> as being, uh, you know, connected to that English landscape tradition, because you were making it in England and yeah. you know various romantics before you had done so. But obviously, you were coming from a very different place, being yeah. influenced by very different things. Yeah. Would yeah. you like to talk a bit yeah, about that? What prompted mm. the context for your walking in that sense? It's um, I'll, I'll have to sort of uh, narrow it all down because <coughs> for myself, because <laughs> I'm involved in it, the, the, the topic and the issues kind of like vast and sort of split off into a million directions. Um, so, so really, the, what, what happened in art history was that um, making art about walking, then it, uh, for, 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 you know, just to say the kind of things that I made were framed photo text works. So you'd have a whole exhibition of framed photo text works. So that's a wooden frame, which is part of the work, although museums in their catalogues edit off the frame. I say the frame is part of the work. Then you have a card, then you have a black and white photograph, and then you have a walk text underneath, what I call a walk text, what some museums have called lettering. So they say this is lettering. Um, you know, and, and so th the issue here is that you go straight to the, the question of medium. What medium do you work in? You know, uh, what material do you use? Because if uh, if you're a painter, yeah, you say yes, I'm a painter. Would you use oil and canvas? Yes, oil and canvas. So that that's kind of start. You know, that you're going in some direction. But when you say you're a walking artist, um, then it, it sort of it, it get, makes the topic go in a different way, different direction. Uh, and I think um, that because, because it wasn't that there was some existing road to go down as, as a walking artist, that I, I kind of naively, in a childlike way, I kind of, I sort of assumed wrong, completely wrongly that people read what it said underneath. I don't think people read the walk text. They, they saw the total and they said, oh yes, a beautiful landscape, and then walked off. They didn't actually register that this was a, about, you know, one of these walks. Um, so I think for several decades, the whole issue of being a walking artist was completely lost. Um, and it's only in the last um, maybe 15 years that I've had to really, any catalogue, any, <laughs> any situation, have to sort of stress the whole business saying I'm a walking artist. Uh, because basically what happened was that um, you, you have these enormous histories, former histories. They, in England, you have the, the history of British uh, landscape painting. And so in the 70s, then people say, oh, th that's the origin of my work, you know, in, in general. Um, and, and, and so at the time, I, I, I knew that that wasn't the case, but I didn't object to it. But now I, I sort of have to go out of my way to object to that, because it sort of, it takes the story to the wrong kind of area, you know. Um, sure. Um, I mean, you touched on the, um, the format of your work, and that was something I wanted to ask you about, because um, you obviously had to develop um, a very particular way of presenting your walking experience in a, in a gallery yeah, context. Yeah, the materialisation. To share it mm. um, with other people. So, um, you know, I'd just like to ask you how, how the physical manifestations um, relate to the experience of walking. Yeah. Um, and, you know, maybe to tell us a little bit about your particular use of text and the style of it, because, um, yeah, I... I very much like to know um, why you think the, the, the way of presenting your work is appropriate in relation to that experiential quality of your yeah. art. Well, at the beginning you said um, <laughs> what I said, um, which was that um, walking art is the, begin the bringing together of two entirely separate disciplines or concerns. Um, and that, that's very important, you know, because they are separate. Um, because um, you could be an artist that doesn't like walking, and you could be a walker that doesn't tolerate contemporary art. So it, it's not a given that the two come together. Sure. Um, so then you, ha then you have this, the issue of, of the medium, you know, the material, because that's art is, you, you know, you, if you pick up a catalog and it says this, a painter, blah, and you, you're immediately into a, some form of a history of painting. Um, but you can't, I can't dodge that question because when you make a walk, how are you going to materialise it? What's it going to be made of? So then that, that brings up all sorts of questions about what you feel you can legitimately uh, use or, or not use. Um, so it, uh, th there's a book came out a couple of years ago called uh, The Sixth Extinction by Elizabeth Colbert, and it, it's about 
the fact that we all, everybody, no matter if you imagine you're the greenest person going, you, you actually, because we're trapped, we're caught inside a whole framework of the way we live today, that, that everybody, no matter what our politics are, and they may be very green, uh, and, and, well, anyway, um, so we, we're still all contributing. So anything that we do is contributing uh, en masse to essentially the disruption, destruction of the environment as a total. Hence, you have at least global warming. I mean, you have millions of things now uh, that, that, we, that we can read about anywhere now. It's a, it's, a, it's a giant subject. So instead of talking about art history and such and such a painting, you know, uh, Goya and so on, then, then you, when you talk about material, then now the art material is now in relation to the giant topic of um, the state of the planet. So... So w when you're an artist, um, then I think, uh, and, and you're thinking about these issues, you, you have to consider what is your art made of? And it, even that, <coughs> is a kind of, um, what's it made of? You know, um, because w one of the things I write in a catalogue, um, a mountain is not made of stone, it, it is stone. So, because when you're in art, you're making something of. You make it, you know, and, and that's... Um, yeah, I mean, if you say a performance artist, they, they, you're still looking at a performance, even though you're not getting a thing. So the, the issue of what, what is it made of is, is enormous, really. And, and because it's um, <coughs> not totally within, inside, the, the, in a sense, this very small world of art making, um, it, it has to do with the condition of the planet and what we, what we use and what we don't use. So, therefore, I, I sort of go out of my way to say that I'm not a land artist because I think land art has completely different priorities uh, entirely. So, uh, when you're a walking artist, uh, a walking artist is, is actually the diametric opposite of a land artist. But they're actually opposites. You know, whereas uh, if I said I'm a walking artist and this artist is a painter, I would have more sort of material relationship with a painter because the painter... It, is using processed materials. Is it using you know can canvas, frame, paint, and so on? Um, and, and so I can I can I relate to that in a closer way than I can when it's using the land in all the different forms of the land, because because that seems directly related to the extractive industries or uh, whatever it may be. There's kind of it, it's me that's put the, these two points together. Not it's not a common way of looking at it. But they are on a spectrum, and and the history of land art uh, doesn't discuss any of this. So la land art, um, in the two or three essays that have been written, you know, I'm included as a land artist. So I, I object to the association with land art. I, I do not at all want anyone to ever think that I'm critical of the art making of other artists. That that's simply not on. You can't do that. Um, so so I think that um, it, it, it's. It's the way art history has gone that you have real land artists, and then you have people like myself, who sort of who would be who could be termed as minor land artists, who are sort of tacked into this bag. Sure. To you know, because you've got to art historically, you've got to go into some box in order to be discussed or categorised. So. Um, do you think? So do you think it's also something to the fact that your your work is ephemeral? Um, you know that your 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 work is the walk. Um, and the things that we see on the wall here um, can be destroyed at the you know it disappears at the end of the exhibition. Yeah, I think there's something in that as well. That's quite an important part of your ethos, isn't it? Yeah, um, but it's a little bit sort of mixed up. Anyway, um, I mean there are different kind of things within the range uh, because this um, you know this this is vinyl, and in the process of the manufacturing of vinyl, it releases you know chemical pollution into the atmosphere. So the, the the making of this work and, and the base at the back of it all, uh, which we don't see, you know, is the, the contribution to the pollution of the atmosphere. So, um, so it's, whatever you do, it's, it has an effect, and so you just have to kind of reduce it down to to what you uh, the direction that you want it to go in, um, because the, um, and, and, you know it, it's not that I make art in order to have something to sell. I actually enjoy making the art. I mean, I want to make this, you know. Um, I, I, you know, because it takes it takes um, some years to kind of um, think about it, and then there are gaps in years between the walks, so it spans a lot of different time, a lot of walks. 
Yeah, and I'd love to ask you about time in a minute, but first of all, I want to just um, expand a little bit on, because um, you just talked very passionately, I think, about the role or the impact of arts in the world, and you have talked about art as um, oxygen for society, and I know that um, you know, your work isn't overtly political, though one or two pieces have, could be construed in that way, um, and I'd just like to draw you out a little bit on that, you know, whether you see your work as a form of protest or um, critique, um, and it, I'm thinking maybe that your position has changed over the years on this, um, you know, as the situation that we're yeah. in has changed. It'd be really nice to hear you talk uh, about that. Uh, yeah, I think, well, I mean, um, um, you know, I mean, I, I, I imagine, you know, I'm, I'm not an abstract painter, but I imagine if you're going into a studio each day for 40, 50 years making abstract paintings, it's about this kind of history, uh, your own history, and then in relation to the greater history of um, Western um, abstract art, you know, from the beginning of the 20th century. Um, but but in, in my case, then, uh, the way I see what I'm doing, it, you know, it's that there are these other things outside of myself which are uh, evolving. So it, it's not that it, it's not that my work is placed in art because very often I'm, I'm completely placed within art, totally placed within art. I, th I think it relates to topics outside of art. Um, so so um, it's quite difficult to. Um, can you give me that question again? Yeah, no, it's just um, reflecting on the statement that you made some time ago about art being oxygen for society. Yes. Like it has a role. It yeah. can do things, it can change things. Um, and um, my feeling was, you know, reading about your work and more recently, that your um, belief in that has increased. It, yeah, it's, it's, it's evolved, that's what I was yeah. saying. Struggling to say that actually, that, that through time, you know, it, it evolves, it doesn't stay, you know, within. Uh, you know, one topic, it, it's affected from outside in, into the work and then and then the history of the work itself. And so there, there are quite a few things to um, evaluate. And um, so we can say that, uh, what one kind of person can say, all, all art is political, or any art is political. And then another artist says, no, 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 my, my art is definitely, I don't want anything to do with politics. But, but um, if you're going for the first option, then, um, all art is political because, um, you know, because denying that it's political is a political decision. So, you, you know, this is a whole big discussion, but you can think of, about it in different ways. You know, you can just say all art is political, um, but in varying degrees. And other art is overtly political. Um, so, so if you become overtly political, too too political, then I think then people become exhausted with the issue of its. You're trying to beat home some message. It's political, and they just become, you know, pissed off and forget it. You know. So I think there's a certain amount that you can do uh, in in pushing the story towards, uh, you know, certain um, ideas, which in my own head I can't not comment on, um, because because that's another issue. You know, are you willing to comment on it, or or um, are you willing for this to sort of happen and say nothing? Um, so I think. Uh, <coughs> The, the, the whole issue of um, what's going on in the environment, it, it's, it's really big. And, and sometimes I read things by ecologists or anthropologists and that I, I can recognize in my own work kind of what they're saying and then, and then I can become influenced and then I can expand my thinking. Um, bec because, for example, one book that I read uh, several times, it's um, called The Other Side of Eden by Hugh Brody, who's an anthropologist. Um, and he's made a study of hunter-gatherer people, and he compares farming with hunter-gatherers. Mm -hmm. And so immediately I, I kind of side with the hunter-gatherers uh, and not the farmers, um, because that's the slant of the book anyway. Um, but, but I could really align with a lot with what he's sort of talking about. Um, you know, uh, he, he makes interesting points, one being that um, people think that the farmer is um, static, you know, stationary, and that the hunter-gatherer is the person who's nomadically wandering about. He actually switches it around the other way, and he says it's the, the hunter-gatherers who operate within a particular type of habitat, and they don't go outside of it. Okay. You know, wh whereas farmers, what, once they've um, worked in a, in a certain... He goes on about farming families, so you have a family, 
and then the children become farmers, and now they, they, they want to expand this farm, so then they move that farm, and gradually it's getting more and more. And then, and then when you, you, know, you read about the environment, and then um, you have the, uh, the subarctic in Canada, and farming is working its way up, and going not heading north. You know, it's being claimed as, as there's you know, global warming and drying and so on. Yeah. Um, and farming is heading north into the subarctic, which is the world's largest sort of un untapped reservoir of uh, raw material, yeah. get, you know, which goes round a lot of the world, round the top. Um, then um, when you read, um, yeah, say again, Hugh Brody, you know, he, he describes going somewhere, I think, in British Columbia in the subarctic, and um, the, you know, the idea is that people, um, you know, Western, you know, European people going from the West to North America, then they would, they would look at the land and they would say, ah, you know, terra incognita, you know, the sort of blank canvas, you know, um, and, and no, no one's living there and uh, there's nothing happening there, no roads, no villages, nothing, you know. But what he's, he says, no, no, this is completely the wrong idea. This whole environment has been peopled for thousands of years, and all these little hillocks and ponds, because you know the subarctic, it's not, it's above the mountains, and it's below the Arctic, so it's quite sort of you know undulating and continuous. Um, so he's saying no, th these places have names. People have lived here for thousands of years, but when you come from an industrial European point of view up in North America, then you say, ah, you know, we can take all these trees down, we can. You know, put a well down here. We can do all these things because this is all this raw material. So you know, the, so the reading about these things feeds into you know my Child. sort of philosophical, if not practical, but philosophical, you know, position. Um, I'd like to um, actually following on to that point, really, um, ask you a much more detailed question about your walks themselves, because um, I mean, some people might think of you as a sort of nomad roaming into these um, wilderness areas or, you know, traversing, you know, these, these large landscape areas. Um, and you have made a huge variety of walks in very different kinds of locations, some extreme, um, and also more closer to home. And I, I'm certainly be really interested to um, know how you prepare for your walks um, and how you decide where to walk. Um, so, for example, are there protocols. I mean, we, we know you're not a conceptual artist, but there seems to be a set of rules or things that you would do or not do when you're approaching making a walk. Um, I think we'd all be fascinated to find out what, you know, how do you make those decisions about where to walk, how long to walk, and so on. Yeah, well, I, I hope I can remember all of that. Um, <laughs> because, well, I, I really because when I hear these things, I, I think of like, 50 thing, and I, and I can't even remember what you said in the first okay, place. Okay, yeah, so, so well, how do you decide to go on board? Well, the, the, the answer to that, um, it, it's not a roundabout answer, but um, for example, uh, in 1971, I walked across the neck of England, uh, you know, in this country. Um, so that's one little walk, and it's um, about 71 miles, 70 miles. Um, so that's coast to coast. So the concept that you're talking about, um, conceptual, you know, I'm not a conceptual artist in that. If we have a definition of conceptual art as being um, a, an idea r remaining within the realm of ideas, I have, a, I, I have an idea which I then transform into an experience. So I have, a, have an idea and then it becomes, a, hopefully later, an experience. So this idea, just walk across the neck of England, very short, very easy. Um, but then I, then years later, then I, um, I've, I've made five coast-to-coast -coast walks on the Iberian Peninsula, for instance. And uh, so that, uh, you know, that, that comes from that one walk in, in the north of England, as, as it were, you know, from the idea of coast-to-coast, -coast because um, uh, the UK, or whatever we want to call it, because it's not exactly united at the moment, um, you might even say it's not particularly great at the moment, but underneath, I'm sure it is. But on the surface, uh, there's a little bit of disruption going on there. Um, uh, but we are a series of islands, yeah. you know, so that sort of poetic phrase, on these islands, yeah. um, it's not the same as Belgium, so it's nothing wrong with Belgium, it just has a different border shape, you know. <laughs> um, so, so you, you know, the issue of water, you go from one water to another water on, on the land, so. Do you have any pre-walk rituals or 
you know, are, are there times when you can't go on a walk because you're not in the right frame of mind? I mean, uh, mm-hmm. I'm really curious yeah. to know what um, happens. No, it's a very, very good, very, very good question. That because um, in the in the sort of process of um, you know trial and error, <coughs> because I made um, walk with other students 1967 and then this walk in 1973. So in the intervening six years, you know, there's trial and error. But the trial and error, of course, after I'd made the decision in 1973 to make uh, only about the experience of walking, then after that, then there were walks, you know, which um, wh- where I had to learn uh, at this point that you're making. Um, so I, I have, um, at least I, on one occasion, I remember uh, leaving home and starting the walk, and then I, I, I just came straight back home because it was in this country that... I, I, my mind wasn't in the mood at all. So you, you've, got to, you've got to join up your mind, really, with that action. You know, and, and sometimes they come together in the most incredible way. And sometimes uh, I've made walks um, where I just think, this is just unbelievably amazing, this walk. You know, it's just like absolutely every aspect of it is completely fantastic. You know, because, because the mind w- was kind of just right for... The, the idea and the location, but I think I think there's a learning process, like learning to mix color when you're painting. Mm-hmm. You know, you can mix a color, and it's, it's you just can't, you know, you can't get the color right. And so it's the same with um, with walking, you know, and the mind. You, your mind has got to be right for it. Yeah. And I, I mean, I know that you've um, done some walks without sleep. There are mm-hmm. at least five walks with no sleep. So you, I mean, how that was obviously some um, way of changing your state of mind while you're walking and, yeah. and how different was that I mean um, yeah, yeah it, I mean it is very interesting I mean let, let's say um, you know you're doing the first all night walk and you know you, you sort of uh, you know well, I don't, can't remember what time I would start out you know or and maybe I start it's a whole day and into a night to the next morning okay. you know, to begin with so when you're going into the night you think yeah this is fine you know the, half past 10, 11, that's no problem, you know, by the time it's going around to quarter past three, then you, you really, it's sort of starting to have an impact on you, and then, and then the sort of the whole walk begins from quarter past three or whenever it is, and then you, you're sort of going into, you know, the, the issue of pushing yourself, really, to, uh, to do that, e- even though there's nothing much to it, nevertheless, it's kind of not what, what your, your body clock is used to, so, um, <clears throat> and then I did make one walk, um, um, you know, going going through the night um, several times. So, what what happened then was that the uh, my entire chemistry, I think, as my opinion, um, changed. And so then I had to minor hallucinations, which I thought were very interesting. You know, because you, you've used you've used things up. That they, your your body chemistry, your, you know, your whatever it is that you've eaten, you know, um, are, are you dehydrating? So it all has an impact on. On that, but I, I've just done a few like that. Uh, I haven't done hundreds of walks like that at all. Just yeah. to, it's like a handful, just to know what it's like, really. Is this kind of related to other cultural practice at all? I mean, I'm thinking of um, other religious practice from other parts of the world, or is it just something you fancied doing? Um, well, be, well, I think it, uh, probably in the first place, I just fancied the idea of walking right through the night because. It, because we're, we're always in the, in the daytime, you know. <laughs> Even if it's the winter and then we go to bed late, it's still, it's like a day, isn't it? And then, and then you say the night is for sleeping. And then, so then you go, you walk right the whole way through the night and then you see the sunrise or you see the dawn. There may not be a sunrise, it might just be the light change. Um, so it, it, it is very real. It, it's, it's, it's one of the possibilities, you know. It's, um, if you're going to walk, then you, you kind of have to walk right through the night a few times to... Because it's it's possible, it's on the, on the range of possibilities. Yeah. Um, while we're talking about, I mean, I think we're talking about duration as well, aren't we now? Yeah, um, duration. So yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm really interested in that too, the time-based aspect of your work, because again, you're not a performance artist, but there is a durational um, aspect, obviously, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, because yeah, you're yeah. working through yeah, time. Yeah, duration is really a, a real, it's something very real. Yes, yeah. and um, I'm kind of interested in that in the way that um, you know, you link walks together because something obviously, as you grow older, um, one of the wonderful things about growing older is that you begin to see links between time, time, places over time, um, and recurrences and so on and so forth. Um, and there's something very beautiful about the way you bring together 
your, 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 your walking experiences, and we're sitting in front of one of these now. Um, so I'd just really like to ask you um, about the acts of repetition and duration yeah. in your work and why that's important to you. Yeah, well, that, it, um, so that's two things, I think, um, yes. duration <laughs> and, um, and, then, and then these, these connecting walks. And because, obviously, <coughs> you've got to have made quite a few walks in order to be able to make a list like this. And at, uh, I've got another list for um, the east of England, uh, where I live, um, that, that sort of general area. Um, and then I've got um, uh, a list for Spain, I've got a list for Switzerland, you know, where, okay. where what one walk, uh, you know, you say you have five walks and then you sort of wake up one day and think, oh, I think I'll join these five. So now you, now you have six. And then so that you have more other different points that then connect. Um, so so um, on a map of Western Europe, I haven't done it yet, but there is, there, there will be a walk that I could uh, plot out on a map, so then I could really join up really a lot of walks, uh, but I haven't uh, haven't done that yet. But that that now is possible simply because this issue of uh, you know the, the time, not three walks, but you know a lot of walks, and then then this becomes a possibility, the linking like that. Um, <coughs> with regard to repetition, that that's another of these um, possibilities. You know, you, um, um, I mean. That, you know, that sort of statement by uh, the Japanese poet um, Basho, you know, when on pilgrimage, you never stay in the same inn twice. You know, so so you, you, you must always go somewhere else, again, again, more and more. But repetition uh, takes you, you know, it's a bit like walking through the night. It's one of the options. And um, people will say, oh, I, you know, what, how could you possibly keep doing that? You know, it must, doesn't it become really boring? You know, so then, of course, you know, Contemporary artists, you always say, you know, it becomes more and more interesting. Yeah. <laughs> um, but the the repetitions, <coughs> for example, what one repetition out there in the world that you were referring to um, would be uh, the repetitions of Tendai Buddhist monks on Mount Hiei, which is okay. northeast of uh, Kyoto in Japan. And some people would say that these are the world's greatest athletes. In that, um, if I can get the number right, they. Uh, uh, over a seven year period they actually when you add up all the kilometers they actually walk around the whole circumference of the world but but not uh, you know walking around the actual world just going around a circuit on Mount EA so it's, it's um, uh, they have different lengths um, and, and one that they do is 80, 84 kilometers walk for 100 days in succession so 84 kilometers, 84 kilometers for 100 days in succession. So this, you know, that, that's why some people, it's not widely known, I mean, it's not, it's not what everyone's saying, but <coughs> some people say, yeah, the world's greatest athletes. Because in order to be able to do that, you've got to have so much of your body mind all worked out. <laughs> you know, you, you couldn't possibly do that otherwise, you know. But they, they, they train for years to arrive at being able to be in a position to do 84 kilometers for 100 days in succession, yeah. <coughs> they can't just do it, you know, after six months or something. So you've, you've been walking for forty-five years now, Hamish. Do you feel trained enough to? No, of course <laughs> not. Of course not. No, I don't, I'm just. Uh, I, I have been there. I've been. I've been on the circuit. Okay. Yeah. Amazing. <coughs> so um, I'm just curious how it felt to link these walks because the walk that you did earlier in in the early summer in May. Here, yeah was linking the previous walks and how, how did that feel and um, I wondered if you could talk about how including the group walks um, how, yeah. how they're different from your own individual walks well yeah Again, that's two questions yeah so. yeah um, <coughs> um, yeah it, it was um, a fantastic little walk um, it was a 12 day walk and um, it was in May when the weather was extremely good and one day <coughs> there was a light rain all day long, and then uh, eleven days of um, just amazing sunshine every day. And for example, when I walked into um, Plymouth, I wasn't too um, uh, hadn't got it all worked out immediately where where I was going to go in relation to the two walks. Um, um, so it was amazing. I just sort of, sort of went like that, and I, and I realised I was in, in the right place. And you know? so sometimes things. Um, uh, by chance, you, you know. Obviously, I wanted to go to the sites of the of the public walks, the group walks, the communal yeah. walks, 
um, but somehow I just kind of arrived there, you know, in beautiful weather in the e a late, uh, early evening. Um, so you have these kind of good moments like that as well. Um, but, but a lot of it um, is, is really sort of going, going f on, on a plan. You know, you have a concept. Can you go from this point to this point, that point? So it's, it, in a sense, it's completely non-visual. You know, it's not like saying, go to a very beautiful, interesting place, some beautiful river valley or some mountain or something. It's not like that. It's just coin, 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 coin. And then, and then within that concept, then you have good luck. Uh, no, not good luck. Good fortune. For things to work out. For things to work out. I'm going to just... Um, I, I just have to make a comment there. That, um, <coughs> I know um, a Norwegian explorer by the name of Erling Kage. And um, he's, he's sort of moving. He, he's also a book publisher. He's an uh, explorer, art collector, lawyer. I mean, he's a crazy person. Um, uh, but he, you know, I, I had the great opportunity to go to his house and meet him, have a conversation with him. And um, <clears throat> I said that I, I did such and such. And I said, I was very lucky. And immediately he said, no, no, I don't believe in luck. No, it's not luck. It's not luck. You know, because his, his idea is that when, when he's done these things, it's because of good planning. There's no luck. There's no luck involved. So even when you have the issue of the weather, he checks out the weather very carefully and so on. It's not luck. You know, he didn't do it by luck. He did it by training and paying attention. That's, that's his idea. I'm going to ask one last question, and that's really to do with numbers, because we're talking about luck. Um, and uh, you, you seem to be incredibly fascinated by um, measuring your walks and the time and um, particularly the number seven keeps cropping up um, you know even to the point where you, the words that you it's select it's the point where it's obsessive right? yeah are actually seven letter words yeah. and you actually point out this is a seven letter word yeah. um, I, I just wonder if you could tell us why you have this obsession with yeah. seven multiples of seven yeah I think, I think you know I understand somebody and think that oh not, not more number sevens and uh, you know, all, all this measuring, you know, it's so obsessive. <coughs> um, why don't you just relax, become free, just go, just wander, you know, you know, the plan of no plan, yeah. that sort of thing. You know, be free, you know. But um, it, it just seems to me that um, once you start putting these things together, and, and they are invisible after all, I mean, um, how, what, what does number seven look like, you know? It's, a, it's not a thing. Um, and then... Um, distances and so on, but they're not actually, they're not really things, they're sort of ideas and um, personal realities for the individual. So whilst it is kind of, um, you know, seen as obsessive and um, so on, um, I, I, think, I think you can build these things for yourself, which, um, you know, they, they start to grow. <laughs> it's, like, it's like growing something, you know, you're fertilizing it and then it's growing, you know. Um, so, so from seven day walks, then you know, then and then the word walking after all is a seven letter word. You know, it goes on and on and on, uh, and and then you know, then I sort of start making great long lists of of seven letter words, and then how how do they fit together and so on, coming from seven day walk. So so, uh, and, and and the seven exists out in the world uh, in cultures all the way through time. So it's not, it's, not, it's not at all my idea. I, it, my, my idea is to sort of discover what people already use the number seven for. So the, the, there are a lot of different kinds of sevens in the world. Um, sometimes, it, you know, you, you just think, oh, that's in, you know, incredible. You know, you just open a book and you, or online, you, you know, Google something, you find this issue of the number seven. It can be really interesting. But as I say, and it's not a thing, you know, so it's um, part of your discovery as yeah. well as your exploration. Mm. Okay, I'm, I think I've asked so many questions that it's probably time to open up to the audience here, if that's okay. So would anyone like to join the conversation? Did, were you interested to find the straightest line between places, for instance? 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, and well, I've got the points to start with, and then, and then a sort of trial and error, really, um, because what looks good on the map, um, m m in reality, when you walk, it may not be such a good place. And by that, I simply mean quantity of traffic. <laughs> uh, so quantity of traffic. You know, it looks like quite a good road, but you get there, poof, and so busy you, you, know, you can't can't cross it or anything like that. Well, it, it, very interesting, you know, the cars are spaced perfectly that you can't cross. There are, there are gaps, but you, no, you, you, know, you can't do it. Um, so the, the, the issue of the map is, I, I quite like maps, um, but I'm, I'm not a map freak. Um, I know people collect them. And, I mean, uh, maps um, become interesting, I think, well, it's just my, you know, everyone's different, have different ideas, but if you have... Um, the map of a country, and then it's invaded by a military force. Now the borderline, you know, what happens to this borderline? You know, I, I kind of find that interesting, whereas um, somebody else would be, you know, and, and UK maps, ordnance survey maps have <coughs> changed through time. You know, it's new buildings, so there's new things on it. Um, but then you have old um, styles of make, map making, which people can be fascinated by, by the graphics. But, uh, I, th I think there are all kinds of ways of thinking about the map. So, but as I say, I, I, I like maps, but I'm not yeah, overly. Yeah. <laughs> how do I write? How do I come to yeah, how, how do I? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. 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 You walked across the street. Yeah, yeah. You could have gone that way. I know. Yeah. Then I have to be walking up and down. No, no. <laughs> I, I don't fancy the idea of just keeping walking on a ferry. <laughs> <laughs> No, so you know, it, it, it's so you don't have a gap. You, you know, bit, all the footprints, all the all the bits where the, you know you've been walking. Uh, they it's all actually quite sculptural. It's like leaving a print somehow. Um, e even if it's not no, traceable, I, uh, it's not a traceable <laughs> trace, but it's. Uh, I, I reject that word. <laughs> She's actually funny enough looking in the catalogue at your work, um, where there are uh, maps of the UK with all the walks on them. It looks like a form of drawing. You know, you're basically drawing. And yeah. When you see it on the map, it looks like that. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> but it's a, it's a different kind of line making. You know, yeah. the origin of, of the line yeah. um, is it, completely different than a, than a pencil. Yeah. You know. But you use a map to do a walk, you use a map and read the map for direction. Yeah. Yeah, yeah as opposed to GPS. It's not a random yeah. experience where you just kind of find your way. Yeah, that, yeah that, of course, that's a possibility, absolutely, you know, that, I mean, in, in this sort of organised world that we live in, you know, that's um, very um, sort of good for the, you know, mental state, mental health, you know, and, you know, put the map away and so on like that, yeah, don't, you know, just wander about, it's quite, it's become quite difficult because they're so obsessed with orders that to have no order becomes, you know, repression. Uh, but the, um, I just have to finish on the map thing because... Uh, you know what popped into my head. Um, uh, I went to the um, Hershon Museum in Washington, where there was an exhibition of <coughs> Ai Weiwei, and one of his artworks was um, the map of China cut through the wood of a um, Tibetan, no, not Tibetan, a um, uh, Chinese Buddhist temple wooden pillar with a map cut, you know, with. Um, I guess it's a, a program of saw, you know, digital map mm -hmm. cut right way through the whole map of China, right the way through the whole piece of wood, which is a, a pillar. Um, so uh, afterwards, uh, he wasn't there, of course, but afterwards there was a Q&A, and so I immediately, I, I, um, because everybody was talking about Ai Weiwei and then China and so on, and, and so I said, well, um, well so then I, I made sure I sat in the front, <laughs> And I went, uh, excuse me, uh, why all this silence about Tibet? And they kind of, the uh, people on the panel were, um, I think it, and someone said, I think he went to Hong Kong. So, um, and, and immediately they, they sort of got, they got tired of me raising this, this issue of Tibet and kind of immediately moved off onto, you know, something more tangible, you know. But the, the issue is that if you look at the map that he made, of course, the, the southwest is, is the, the border of Tibet, which they, they invaded. And so, so it's a map of China. 
and they have claimed um, they've claimed Tibet militarily. Um, so, so it's very interesting to research um, the, the, the map evolution of the outer shape of what was his historic sovereign of Tibet. And because now it's all changed shape and it becomes small. And they, and they kind of deny everything, which is... Uh, it's a very good example of your political yeah. engagement. Because yeah. it's been a real preoccupation and well that you've managed, but manifested. I mean, you haven't, you haven't kind of gone on about it, but it's been a very present yeah, it's been thing a lot in your life. life. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you, yeah, yeah. Um, but because it, it, it just seemed sort of like a glaring gap, you know, that, uh, because it, we're, they were talking about, you know, materials and bicycles and all, all different things, you know, and not, um, they haven't got on, to, they haven't touched on the issue of Tibet. Then some months or a year or so later, and um, the fantastic woman uh, commentator, activist, uh, Wosa, um, w O E S E R, and she joined up with Ai Weiwei and they made a publication together. So, so eventually, so there was this connection. It wasn't that I'd got it all wrong. You know. I mean, I'm not saying whether I'm right or wrong, it doesn't matter. Um, you know, there was a connection. Sarah, I'm reading, I've got two questions. Um, so, the first one is about your state of mind while you're making the book. Um, and is it is it sort of mantric or the points where it's like that? And other points where it's quite pragmatic. I simply have to get from here to there and by this time because you know I need to rest or eat or whatever. Um, and the other question is because you've been walking for so long, and some of these walks now have been revisited, is observing the change in the landscape that you go through or the environments that you go yeah. through. Mm. Um, well, the, in in terms of oh. Uh, it, to answer the second one because I can't remember the first one. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> the second one, the, the changes are, are, are incredible. Um, in 1972, I walked from where we used to live in Kent, a um, place called, well, um, near the coast, near the cliffs of Dover, not too far away, um, and I walked to a place called the Stifer Stones on the border of England and Wales. It's a kind of rocky uh, outcrop. And um, that, that walk was like, um, I didn't realise it at the time, 1972, it was like a dream walk, because you could just walk along uh, with, a, with a small light rucksack, because nothing much to carry, another pair of socks or something. Um, it, and then you, you then end up in a, vi in a village or a small town, you just knock on the door, you, you know, a um, bed and breakfast. Do you have a room? Yes, thank you. <laughs> come straight in. You know, you come to the next village, do you have a room? Yes, certainly no problem, come straight in. You know, it, you could do it so easily. Now it's. Um, it, uh, I, I've done various walks where the, this whole change issue. Well, that's one element of the change. Not. I mean, I know you, we've got wind turbines and so on, but um, but, but that kind of change the the, the, the connection of the the, um, the smartphone and the car means that every everywhere that you arrive is already booked yeah. because they is all booked in advance, and that you so the whole booking in, in advance business. And also paying in advance, <laughs> so so you know because uh, it's very, it's very I, I find it very interesting that that kind of transformation that you, you can't in other words and um, you can't be spontaneous and, and you sort of can't have that sort of chance element you know yes and the, and so thank you for answering that and the first part really is the is the are you what sort of state of mind are you in while you're making the walk? Or does that vary like it would yeah. in any normal day? You know, sometimes you're quite focused and other times thinking about a range of things or just noticing where you are. Oh, yeah, the, yeah. thank you. Um, the, 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 I have different categories of walks and so they kind of uh, result in different kinds of, um, you know, mm, mental states, you know. Um, so, um, Years ago, road walking, not not many vehicles, <laughs> uh, and so um, like I mean, like in Spain, some enormous, great big, long straight road. You walk down the road, you know, you can think of absolutely anything you want because there's no navigation. It's it's like, you know, 15 kilometres a straight line, so there's nothing to think about. Um, uh, or that, or then that. So then, in these situations, you can uh, experiment with um, uh, thinking of a topic and just like thinking of it continuously as much as possible you know, for, for a whole long, great long distance or make an attempt to think of as little as possible. <coughs> um, 
So, you know, that, that can turn into a struggle. You know, you're struggling to think of as little as possible. Um, that, then a different kind of walk where uh, you become really, it can be a road walk, and you become, you, you, you go into the state of, uh, you know, really a lot of exhaustion. And then, you, and then you realize that you haven't been thinking about anything very much for two or three hours because <laughs> you're so exhausted. You know, because exhaustion turns into, uh, instead of sort of perverse or weird or uh, why do you want to feel like that, um, it, it is a kind of, it's like the duration. Mm -hmm. actually, it, it turns into an, an actual um, sort of dimension, an element, uh, the, the, the exhaustion, you know, because um, then you, you, you're not struggling to think of less. You know, it just comes about naturally. Um, then a different, completely different kind of walk where you have to watch out where, you, where your feet, or rather your boots, are going to go. Um, because if you're thinking about something, you know, some gallery that didn't pay you, or you know, <laughs> whatever, <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, or some, you know, something like uh, this category of annoyance, you know, that you, you know, um, so that, and then that's exactly when you trip, you know, and fall flat on your face. So there's the terrain, you know, demands. You know more um, attention, and so when, when you I'm not a rock climber, I'm not a mountaineer, but when you transfer that to rock climbing, then um, uh, that the, the uh, climber called Alex Honnold. You know, he, he, if you want to see um, some climbers on YouTube, Alex Honnold, um, El Capitan, and all these different climbs, um, solo, no rope, and so on. I mean, they're all. I mean, there are they're incredible people doing things today. Um, and so if he thinks of something, like, a, you know, his, his truck's in the parking lot and it's expired, you know, that's like a bad move and it's danger. And, uh, so you, you need to, um, yeah, I mean, there, there are lots of different possibilities with, with the mind because the, the body's carrying the mind everywhere, you know, so. Um, um, on, on, and then on some walks, um, you, you know, where you, get, you really have a lot of exhaustion <coughs> and you're not eating enough because it, you're, it's a camping walk. So that's all there is to it. You, you can't carry a lot of food. So less um, sort of wh whatever it is, protein, uh, carbohydrate, whatever it is, it's not enough going in. There's plenty of liquid, not enough food. And then after a few days, three or four days, then this starts to change your dreams. You have the most extraordinary kind of dreams. You go, my goodness, you know. It's, um <laughs> so so there are a lot of impacts, you know, coming from doing the walking. I think there's a question over there and then that's okay. I think you mentioned the, the health of planet and also your attitude of mind before you walk. There was a, an article in the at the weekend about a chap who's in deep dark current chair, deep dark depression, he's almost given up. He sets off on a for some reason on a little walk and then he's just carried on walking and then you, you may know about this and then no. Basically, transformed himself out of his depression. Um, and I just wondered about, as well as the attitude of the health of the planet, the, the attitude of the health of your mind produced by the walk, not, which you just touched on, but and spreading the idea that people should do more walks because it's so damn healthy, and that as soon as you do it, you feel so much better. How, how much do you evangelize walking? <laughs> um, yeah. I, I don't really evangelize it, but I am um, totally, um, I totally uh, believe in it, and um, and I do see the, the real benefits. And um, so, in relation to what you just said, um, um, the most recent walk I made was a um, one-month walk in Norway, a camping walk. So I was camping for 28 nights, and you can carry three weeks of food in a rucksack, but. Not, not a month. <laughs> not, it's not, you can't get a month's worth of food in a rucksack plus anything else, like a handkerchief or something. Yeah. There's no room. You know? So I had to eat um, in lodges, which are in this national park where I went. And, uh, and I was just amazed at uh, how, many, how many sort of super fit you know, people there <laughs> were. Uh, and what was really the, the, the biggest issue for me were uh, children. So they're like five, seven year old children walking to the top of mountains, you know, and um, there was, they're, not, they're not very high, you know, they're, they're um, 2,300 metres, mountains like that, and I was at the top of one, and um, the, the weather ordinary was fantastic, of course, July, but on this one, um, 
uh, going on to um, a sort of glassy or the thin layer of snow. Uh, you couldn't see very far, but there's, there's no danger at all. There's no wind or anything. Um, and then coming the other way, I saw um, a young mother, maybe 30, with a, like a boy, five. And I just thought, it's just incredible. You know, because, it, because that's the future, really. If, if, if a small child has that, and they're not, they're, and you haven't ruined them on it, you know, because the, the danger is that you put them off for life, rather than hurrying them, and you've just done it in one go, and they're all, no, no, no thank you, I'm not doing that. Um, so I, I think that was really incredible. It's small children, I saw quite a few. And some of them are really, you know, 10, 15-year-old kids, really fit, unbelievable. Because uh, there the was that article uh, in, in one of the papers that I read on the train coming here, um, uh, it's not, not a funny story at all, but about how much time English children spend indoors. Yeah. Um, so th th this kind of thing was the, was the reverse. You know. uh, but I think in Norway it's generational, you know, it's like all the families uh, which sort of pass the sort of experience on, you know, so you see, you see it a lot, so it's very impressive. I think there's time for one more question. No, I'd like to ask you about your um, walk texts. Because after all, with the images, this is the way we have to encounter the experience you had through the walk. And the two questions I wanted to ask you was, first of all, do you regard them as objective statements or as triggers or recollections or something that we can, that we can take on? And, uh, and the second is about your choice of uh, typeface in relation to the idea and the materialization of the idea to the experience of the walk. Is there anything, is there any relationship between the font that you use, the dimensions, the, the spacing of lines, the colour, the, spa the, the spacing between words? Because I can see that there, for instance, on, on the top line, for instance, and you also use black and red and so on. Is there any kind of graphic correlation between the experience that you're registering in the text? Um. The, there's just the informational connection, you know, because <coughs> this graphically this could look completely different. I mean, I, you could make a, a, a totally different design. So, uh, but part of the thing, uh, of course, uh, all the way through the works that I've been making, you know, is that is the reduction because there's far too much to put in. So, it's sort of, it's, it's not possible, you know. I mean, let's say there's no mention of wildflowers, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so, it's, uh, masses are left out. So, it, it's kind of shrunk down to this, uh, certain sort of names that people in this part of the world would know, you know, like Plymouth or Penzance, it would mean something as a location. So it, it's all, it, it's greatly reduced. And then the, the, the century Gothic, which is this typeface, um, you know, the, uh, I, like the, I like the complete circle of the O, for example. I mean, the thing, the, you, know, you can argue that's c completely irrelevant. You know, you could use a totally different um, typeface, a uh, yeah, different color, different shape, um, so you know, that's kind of not infinite, but there are many possibilities in that way. Um, so it's just to develop a kind of a language, um, a sort of language style. Um, so uh, the, the the black relates to um, you know this year, and then and then the grey is the former, and then uh, you know, I'm saying it's obvious, but then the red is to pick out the points that um, are, are repeated or connected with. Yeah. You know, so so th there's all of that. Um, Element. What was your um, other question? I, I did hear it, but I can't remember it now. Um, well, I asked about the, you, know, okay, you asked the question about the choice of font. But does the choice of font in any way sort of say this? Well, this is Hamish Thornton. He uses this font. Is there any kind of connection like that? that one uh, well, one um, that I think um, I think I started out with um, Times New Roman um, in the early seventies, and then that was joined with uh, Helvetica Medium. And then, and then for several decades, um, this um, typeface. And so I think, uh, um, th you know, th this kind of area of contemporary art is where people sort of repeat things and they have, um, mm -hmm. they make connections. They, um, Alan Charlton paintings, there, you know, some form of grey, for example. And so you have a, you sort of build on a continuous um, familiarity kind of. Right. Aspect. You get to Lawrence Wiener and the fact that. Yeah. He yeah, you can recognise it. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Sorry, what was the other question? <laughs> <laughs> it's very high down, isn't it? Like, in 
way as you're trying to um, experience your walk, which is sort of emptying out, it seems, you know, a distillation of your experience. In yeah. The way the pared downness of the texts. Uh, yeah. Sort of because because it's sort of too much to put in, you know. So. Yeah. Could I, could I just ask, you, the, the texts that you do on most walks, are they similar format to this? Is that, is that how you... I'm a consumer of art, so, and, and I'm looking for something to feed off. Is this what you're giving me? Is this generally what you give people, you know, a, a, these descriptive words um, in a font? I'm not quite clear what how the uh, well, how I don't know your work, so yeah. this is so, my so experience. It's, it's, it's and I've heard you yeah. talk a lot about your political opinions and yeah. philosophical, yeah. and that's very interesting. But I, I don't. Is, is when you go for a walk and you pr produce a work of, is this is this the for, is this how it's? This this is one of the possibilities yeah, right. yeah. It, it, as a the, as a medium. Yeah, this is one possibility. The other one I was mentioning is framed photo text works. Um, Painting small wood, wooden objects, you know, what I call um, walk text on wood, not sculpture. And um, so the, 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 I make different kinds of things, uh, limited edition prints. Um, I make well, uh, one film. Um, you know, I, I don't want to um, sort of only make this kind of work. I, I, uh, you know, I like the idea of different mediums. But all, it's all processed material. There are certain No. Yeah. And usually factual rather than descriptive. Yeah. 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 Um, but you allow us to fill in a lot. You expect us to be able to imagine something like that. Passage from sentence to sentence. Yeah. Yeah. But whatever. Because because I think that you can have have it all um, just factual, or um, and that can be contrasted with um, descriptive. Uh, you know so. You, you do sort of enter into the, the world of literature, you know, um, mm -hmm. or an aspect of literature, or what, it, or what literature, you know, points to. I tend not to use very much description. Not too much, a little, yeah. I think, um, I think it's now time for us to bring the conversation to a close. So I'd just like um, to thank you, the audience, for um, your attention and being so kind and lovely, um, but also to thank Hamish for oh, thank speaking you. so yeah, candidly um, to us this afternoon. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you.